Hello, everybody. Uh, we are in the last stages of our discussion of molecular genetics. And the next uh, module, we'll be moving towards something kind of different, kind of practical, um, microbes and the immune system. Uh, but to finish up on our discussion of things that are fascinating and important and amazing, um, I wanted to take you through a little tour of kind of like where this is all going. What is the good of having all this knowledge about molecular genetics? Okay. And uh, I think uh, I'm hoping you'll be surprised by how much you actually understand of these basically cutting edge ideas and things that are not even realized today, but we know that well, they're, they're uh, really, uh, really close to getting to these points in the near future because of what we've learned about molecular genetics and how we can make manipulations on genes. Okay. And so uh, it's going to start with three basic premises. Um, each one of these is kind of uh, a concept on its own. And they, they do follow from the things that we've talked about so far. Um, and uh, maybe they're a little bit of an extension, but they're uh, basically supported really nicely in the textbook. And so I was going to move back and forth between my whiteboard and the textbook, mostly in the textbook, I think, because I do want you to realize that what I'm discussing with you right now is not especially um, anything at all of a departure uh, from what you guys are getting from the textbook readings, right? Okay, and so the first premise uh, here is that uh, development, that is the, the sequence of things that makes an animal look like an animal, um, starting out with a zygote, which really doesn't look like anything, right? I mean, if you look at your zygote, zygote of a human compared to the zygote of any other human, it looks the same. But not only that, your zygote looks exactly the same as the zygote of a chipmunk, right? And um, yeah, they're both mammalian fertilized eggs, okay? They both have pretty much the same parts. The, you know, the proteins are um, very similar. I mean, there might be some subtle differences. Um, and what makes you a human and not a chipmunk, and what makes a chipmunk a chipmunk and not a human, has nothing to do with the actual parts that are put together, right? Um, the, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the lipids, they're pretty much the same. You could make a perfectly good human out of mostly chipmunk parts. You can make a perfectly good chipmunk out of mostly human parts, right? What is it? that uh, makes the differences between you and a chipmunk? Well, it's it's how those parts get put together, right? Um, and what that means is we're gonna be turning on regulatory genes. Uh, those are the genes that will activate transcription factors. Transcription factors will determine what other genes are turned on, when they're turned on, where they're turned on, um, how much of the gene proctor is being produced. So th this is what I really mean, okay? Uh, when I say the development of animal bodies is largely controlled by the regulatory genes. And by regulatory genes, I mean largely those genes that are making transcription factors, which then will activate other genes. And some of those other genes will themselves be transcription factors. And so if you go back to that pie diagram I showed you in the previous video, you'll realize that there are way more regulatory genes than there are the actual genes that go into what makes you, uh, makes your physical body, right? And, and so there's a hugely complex program of transcription factors that has to unfold in exactly the right way, okay? And to, to illustrate that, I'm gonna use the uh, picture from 11.12. Um, shown here. And you can see that uh, we've got a fruit fly on the upper left. This is a normal one. And it is, um, it has the normal parts, right? It's got, uh, in, in particular, it's got antennae here. Okay, these two things, this is an antenna. It kind of goes like this. If you're looking at it from the side, it does that, right? Okay. Um, over on the lower right, instead of an antenna, this is an actual leg. It's like a, the walking leg. If you look further back in the fruit fly, uh, this 
this fruit fly basically has two walking legs coming out from the place where the antenna should be. Right? And yeah, that's weird. Uh, we call this mutation antennapedia. which basically means antenna foot, because we've got uh, feet coming out from where the antenna is supposed to be. It's got, got a cute little name. Um, and it's basically telling us a, a few things about animals. It's telling us that antennae, when we look at an antennae, um, it, it really is a modified leg. Okay. It's like the, uh, the ancestral insect had a whole bunch of um, body segments that were all producing legs. Okay. This might have been the an ancestral animal that had many, many copies of these legs. And the first legs, the legs that were at the very front of the body, <clears throat> it, it turned out that it was, it was a really good idea for them to be sensory. And so they had chemical receptors. And they, they allowed the, uh, the ancestral insect ancestor to detect food, to detect predators, to detect other things. And so slowly it, it was modified to the point that at a later stage, instead of developing normally, which would make it look like a leg, it basically became highly specialized and, and developed instead like these little antennae okay, that were kind of similar. They, had, they have joints. I mean, they have kind of like the similar thing to knees and the joints in your feet, except they don't look like legs or feet at all. They're, they're antennae, and they've got a far greater amount of sensory hairs, chemical receptors. And so that's what an antenna normally does. And so uh, what, what I'm telling you here is that there are genes that are required to cause the appendage on the front segment to develop as an antenna instead of as a leg. And all you have to do is to make one genetic change, change one switch, and we don't go through that normal pathway of development, we end up having the legs, instead of being developing as modified legs and antennae, they develop as regular legs. Okay. And and, and so yeah, this is one of the, this is one of the first bits of information that, that showed us how important these regulatory genes are in uh, not only fruit fly development, but basically in development generally, right? Um, how is it that we make cells become different from the other cells in the body in the right locations at the right times as needed to make a single cell zygote undergo this fascinating and almost inconceivably complex trans transformation uh, to form whatever kind of animal it eventually becomes, right? And so that's kind of a profound area of thought in the area of, of uh, developmental biology. and. Um, and that's kind of like our first premise, right? So the things that we've been talking about so far, in particular, the transcriptional control, that fine scale transcriptional control where you get transcription factors being coded for by regulatory genes and making them turn on at the right times. That's kind of what's necessary in order for all the parts of an animal to take shape in the way that they're supposed to take shape. And uh, now I'm going to switch shares, go back to my whiteboard. And, uh, and now we're looking at premise two, right? Um, premise two says that, uh, this is a, kind of on, in a different um, light. Premise two is going to say that, well, cells start out with this characteristic pluripotency, which you remember from the textbook means an ability to form all the different kinds of cells in the body, right? Uh, so when you were a zygote, right? You were just one cell, a single mighty cell, and that cell could become earlobes, it could become kneecaps, it could become liver, it could become um, kidneys, it could become uh, egg cells or sperm cells. Okay, at that stage, you haven't really distinguished yourself as male or female. All the different kinds of cells in your body, the thousands and thousands of different kinds of cells, are all possible okay, from the state of being a zygote. Right. But then as time goes on, you lose certain abilities, right? You know, so maybe as you come, become a male, you lose the ability to form eggs. You become a female, you lose the ability to become, to make, uh, to become sperm. Um, if you are, are a cell in the outer portion of the embryo, 
you lose the ability to form the kinds of structures needed to become parts of the, uh, the stomach and intestine. And so uh, gradually your ability to uh, have this pluripotent capacity is lost, okay? You, know, you go from pluripotent to uh, multipotent to unipotent eventually, okay? Eventually when you lose all the different possibilities, you're basically following a pathway to become one kind of cell. It becomes a final differentiation or terminal differentiation. Okay. And that's the end of the story. You know, that's when your uh, your eyelash cell or your kneecap cell or your um, your skin cell um, becomes looking like a skin cell and carrying out its function, right? I mean, if, if you think about a nerve cell, right? Uh, a nerve cell, which has got a, a cell body, a long axon, terminal, bouton. Basically, this is a really complex structure. And once you become this kind of cell, you're not going to be undergoing cell division anymore. You're just going to be a nerve cell, right? Um, and, and that's it. Once you become the cell, you take up residence inside the brain or inside the spinal cord or inside the peripheral nervous system, uh, that's it. You're, you're, you're pretty much done, and, and which is why you, we don't have the ability to regenerate uh, a lot of tissues, th especially things like nerve cells, because the cells, uh, even the cells that are differentiated to become in nerve cells are, have themselves been lost as a result of development, okay? And so the idea here is that most of the cells in your body are terminally differentiated at the time that they're actually functioning. Your skin cells are never going to be dividing to form new skin cells. They can be replaced by cells just before them in that differentiation. So you might have some unipotent stem cells that are capable of becoming skin cells, and they continue to produce more and more skin cells. And that's how you're able to re regenerate your skin. You don't have those unipotent nerve cells, which is why you're not able to regenerate your nerve cells. Okay. But the general idea here is that, um, yeah, as cells are becoming uh, specialized, they're becoming less able to, be, to do everything. Okay. And, and then this itself is controlled by transcription factors. We, we lose the ability of the genes to respond to the different combinations of transcription factors that become highly uh, picky in terms of the transcription factors that are required in order to get them to be active. Okay. So uh, yeah, the uh, this concept of loss of pluripotency is the reason why most of your tissues, or at least many of your tissues are not able to regenerate uh, if they're lost. Which is a problem medically, because if you were to have, for example, nerve cell damage, that's pretty much it. I mean, if if you lose your nerve cells, you you don't regenerate them. That nervous connection is completely lost, um, and uh, and that's kind of sad, right? And that's that's a problem for medicine, um, in that there might be some kinds of of insults to the body's normal anatomy that cannot be repaired, okay? Uh, and that's premise number two. And to support that, um, there's also something in the textbook that is kind of uh, weird, but it, it works. I like it, it works, which is that, um, If you were to look at a carrot, okay, if you were to look at a carrot, we, we don't have that loss of, of pluripotency. I mean, it's actually pretty easy to take any cell from a plant, uh, tissue culture it, and regenerate an entire clone from that one cell, right? So if you had, um, if you had like this, particularly tasty dragon fruit, right? 
and you wanted to clone that dragon fruit to make a plantation of dragon fruits. You could, you could, I mean, not terribly easily, but you could hire people in uh, in the field and just take that single dragon fruit and break it apart into a million cells. And from each of those cells, you could generate a complete clone of that really tasty dragon fruit plant. And you, you'll end up with an entire plantation that you've gotten from this one fruit that you collected from the supermarket. I mean, it's it's you know, it's it's weird, uh, but plants are pretty easy to reverse that differentiation. You have the, you have a differentiation, but it's not terminal in the way that um, differentiation is for animals, right? And and so uh, the reason why this is kind of crucial is because well. Um, for animals, um, we would like to be able to do things like um, regenerate nerve cells, but we don't have the cells immediately before them. But if we were to start out with brand new pluripotent cells, like the ones that we're collecting from embryos, from human embryos, right? You could take a human embryo, an embryonic cell, and cause it to differentiate make it differentiate along the normal pathway of cellular differentiation uh, and, uh, and development. And you could basically replace cells that would otherwise be irreplaceable, right? And so uh, stem cell therapy, um, the, the whole idea of using embryonic stem cells uh, for, th for, uh, for, for health problems, um, I'm sure you've heard about it as, as having a great deal of promise and also a great deal of controversy because the way that we're having to use um, aborted human embryos is the source for some of these cells, right? And so our ability to develop the technology is limited by the, the uh, lack of avail availability uh, or the, the questionable um, ethics behind the raw materials that are used to do that kind of therapy, right? And so the, you know, this this concept is you know, you know maybe familiar to you. I hope it's familiar to you because after all, most of you are going to become healthcare professionals, and um, and the idea that these cutting edge therapies involving stem cells uh, could hold great promise and at the same time are subject to particular kinds of controversies and debates because of the of, of many issues, including the ethics of collecting cells from aborted embryos. Okay, so I mean, we're not gonna make an ethical decision in this class. I'm just wanting you to be aware that that is um, uh, a thing. Okay, and so at this point, we're all on the same page. It would be great if we had a source of, of stem cells, of pluripotent cells that we, that we could use for this type of therapy. Uh, but, but sadly, um, the only cells available to us are these cells that are collected from aborted fetuses, which is not a happy situation for at least those fetuses. Okay. Um, now, uh, here is where things get exciting, right? Uh, exciting point number one. Uh, well, uh, turns out that the whole idea of terminal differentiation is greatly exaggerated. And it turns out it is. Uh, possible to undifferentiate cells uh, and convert a, a, a differentiated cell into one that is pluripotent. It's called induced pluripotency. Okay. And so induced pluripotent stem cells is um, a way of, of providing the raw materials for stem cell therapy, uh, hypothetically by using a patient's own cells, right? You could say, well, it's it's a little bit artificial because if, uh, if Jack is uh, having to deal with nerve cell damage and uh, Jack has to get cells from some random embryo that was aborted at some random location, those embryonic cells are not necessarily a good match for Jack's genome, right? But if Jack is able to use his own cells, that would be a far better option, correct? 
And so, yeah, induced pluripotency is like a, a big smiley face on everybody involved because we don't have to use aborted fetuses and we're able to make uh, pluripotent cells from a patient's own cells. Right? And so what I want to show you now is a um, different page on this, which is just a page from cell research. I mean, this is not the... Uh, the original uh, writing, but, but basically what, what, what uh, I want to point out to you is that we've got this methodology in which we're able to use um, these things, they're called Yamanaka factors, uh, and o -O OCT3, 4, uh, SOX2, KLF4, C, Mike, are, are things that are highly expressed in embryonic cells. These are transcription factors, right? So in other words, what we're saying here is that if we put the right cocktail of transcription factors on any cell that you take from the body, there's a chance that we might be able to get them to revert back to the state of pluripotency. And, uh, and that's exactly what's happened. And that's really super exciting because we've unlocked this, um, this key uh, hurdle of being able to re- restore pluripotency in a patient cells, which would then allow us to turn around and create new cells to replace ones that are damaged. Okay? So in other words, induced pluripotency is a great thing for what we're talking about. It's also completely re related to what we've been talking about in the last couple of videos, because we're actually using transcription factors. to uh, reverse the effects of all the transcription factors that have been at work since the time that these cells have been embryonic pluripotent cells, right? In other words, it's by transcription factors that are zygote lost pluripotency, and it's by transcription factors that we're able to restore the pluripotency to cells that had already become differentiated, okay? And that's, that's pretty cool. All right. So here's the thing, though. If you have um, if you have a patient with some deficiencies, with some absence of functioning cells in their body, um, yeah, maybe we could repair and re and restore the function of that missing parts. You know, those missing cells, if we were able to have some pluripotent cells to convert into those cells that are missing, right? But, but what if the reason why those cells are functioning badly in the first place is due to genetic deficiencies? In other words, okay, uh, Jack has a defective retina, okay? And his vision loss because of this problem in the retina. And, and yeah, we could make new retinal cells by um, taking some pluripotent cells from Jack and cutting them to differentiate into retinal cells to replace the ones that are lost. Hey, that's great. Except those retinal cells that we make from Jack's cells that have been restored to pluripotency, are gonna, they're going to carry the same genetic defects as the cells that were differentiating badly the first time. See the problem? Okay, so yeah, uh, yeah, maybe we can get uh, really good donor cells from the host themselves. But what good is getting donor cells from the host himself if those donor cells are going to have the same genetic deficiencies that the host had, which caused them to go to the hospital in the first place? Right? Yeah, and and so. Uh, and so here we come to the next cool and awesome thing. And here's where, if you haven't heard of this yet, um, CRISPR-Cas9. This is kind of like our our new way of of um, editing genes. Editing genes with CRISPR-Cas9 is. Uh, <laughs> surprisingly easy and extremely versatile to the point where 
it's actually completely possible for us to take those patient cells, the ones that have the bad genes, and repair just the genes that are bad. And then with the pluripotent cells that have been restored, the, the, uh, the, the normal genetic function that's been restored, we would be able to, to go through this to stem cell therapy and replace the tissues that are deficient in that patient. And, and, and so, yeah, we're going to go back to the other share again. And uh, now we're going to be looking at um, the last thing that I had you read for today, uh, chapter 12 and DNA technology. And there's a whole lot. And there, you, can, you can develop this as much as you want. But um, on 12.5, okay, it talks about CRISPR-Cas9, the system is the and, and and the way that this is different from, for example, the restriction enzymes that we used in the laboratory is that um, instead of having to use to target a particular uh, motif, like the, yeah, I don't know if you remember this. I, I don't remember it. G, C, X, G, C, or something like that. I mean, if, if, um, F new 4H1 required this particular restriction sequence, then we were limited to only making cuts where we saw this, right? But in the case of CRISPR-Cas9, we could we could determine what the what the enzyme is going to search for. So we could tell the enzyme to search for uh, C A G G C C G A. T C A. You, you could you could make a sequence of pretty much any length, okay, and say, okay, well, um, enzyme, go and make a cut anytime you see this particular sequence, which makes which means that we can target only specific portions of the DNA sequence because only that portion of the DNA is going to have that target sequence. Okay? And once we make the cut, it's a relatively easy thing to correct the uh, the sequence and put. Uh, uh, the, the a template for the uh, the repair, and we end up with uh, a gene that is no longer having the genetic defect that had been there in the first place, uh, causing the, the problems that were accruing in our original patient. See that? Okay, I know I know this is a lot, but. Um, but the idea is that we're taking all of these ideas that are coming to us from Bio, two, bio 110 and combining them to create a cute story, a, a cute but com complicated and exciting story in which things that had not that long ago been pretty much uncurable. Sorry, Pell, you're out of luck. We're not able to repair that kind of damage. Um, became a little bit more hopeful yeah, we can repair that damage, but we have to use a aborted fetus to do so, right? To now we can make uh, new cells from your own body. Uh, the problem is that your body has some genetic effects which caused the problem in the first place. To where we are now, where it, where it seems like all the hurdles have been overcome. Yeah, we can replace those bad cells with cells from yourself after we've repaired the genetic deficiencies that caused you to have a lesion in the first place, right? Which is which is astounding. It's it's amazing. It's cool. And it's you know, pretty much um, the kind of thing that we'd like you to be somewhat literate on having come through a class like Bio 110. All right? That's it for this video.